Going into to Heart for the House, uh, this is kind of one of the times a year I really like to be in sync with, all, with what all of our pastors at all of our locations are doing. So uh, we kind of, you know, a week or two ago, talked a little bit about uh, you know, what direction do we, do we all want to go. And so uh, I, I say all to say, if you went to hear Pastor Jason at uh, Mesa last night, uh, teaching is a very similar message. We kind of talked about a general topic and kind of went our own ways with the general topic. Uh, and so we're, I'm going to talk today about, uh, about the oil that is part of or, or flows through the house. And so uh, if we're going to begin by opening up our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 4, First Kings chapter 4, I'll read a verse 1. Is that where I want to be? Second Kings, I'm like, I wrote something down wrong. First Kings 4 is good too, but it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. Second Kings 4, there we go. Verse 1, it says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant... My husband is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Okay, so we, we find ourselves in a story with this woman who comes to the prophet Elisha and says, in a desperate situation, anybody ever been in a really desperate situation? Anybody ever had the creditors <laughs> coming? Hopefully they weren't going to take your children. I don't think we have laws like that in our nation, but, but they probably want to take a lot of what you had. But the, the, she was in a, in a desperate situation. I want to give you a little bit of background about who she is, who her husband probably was, and, and why she calls out to Elisha. Now, it says that she was the wife of, the, of one of the sons of the prophets. It's also uh, other places called the Company of Prophets. You can just go back two chapters, and it talks a little bit about who this company of the prophets were. And they were, there were three groups of them in three different cities. There was one in the city of Jericho, there was one in the city of Bethel, and there was one in the city of Gilgal. And there were about, about 50 of them, uh, either all together or in each one. I, I wasn't real clear. Uh, but we read about them in, in 2 Kings chapter 2, because this is, they were in the story where Elijah and Elisha were on their way to, um, well, for, for, for Elijah to be taken up into heaven and the, the torch to be passed from Elijah to Elisha. And you read about these, these company of the prophets or the sons of the prophets who were sort of the, the, the under prophets, if you will. They worked with and worked for the prophets. So I tell you this to say that this is a woman who is in a situation where her husband, who was a servant of God, who was working with Elijah and Elisha, uh, well, he's passed away. And not only did he pass away, when he passed away, he left a lot of debt. And so this woman is probably in a situation, maybe a little bit frustrated, because she understands, as people of her day did, promises that have been made, that, boy, if you, if, if you are faithful to God and you serve him, you should be taken care of. And her husband was someone who faithfully served the Lord, and yet he was in debt and has now died and left her with a whole lot of debt. And so she's going right to the source, right? That's like coming to the pastor going, Pastor, you said if I was faithful and I give, right, the Lord's going to take care of things in my life and it doesn't seem to be working. What's up? So this woman comes to Elisha, but she cries out, I need help. Like, they're, they're going to come take my sons. And now, there's some other things in play here. The community probably, or not probably, should have taken care of her. If her husband was, was one of these in the groups of the prophets, that means she lived in an area that was, that was Jewish, which means there were certain things that they were commanded and told to do. The community should have rallied around her as a widow to take care of her. She shouldn't be in this situation. Uh, that that you may think, well, because she has two able-bodied sons, maybe they don't, but they want to take her two able-bodied sons, and what's this going to leave her with? A widow with no one to help her, and her community doesn't even care. And so this is a situation that she's in. So she calls out to the prophet. Now let's read the next couple verses. 
So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. So the prophet, now let me give you a little bit of of biblical types uh, here that if we were to look at the prophets Elijah and Elisha, Elijah, Elijah was a picture of or a forerunner of John the Baptist who prepared the way for Jesus. Elisha is kind of a picture of Jesus who picks up, we, we, if you read this story back in 2 Kings 2, he asks for a double anointing of what Elijah had. He says, I want what you have, but I want double what you had. I want to be twice as powerful as what you were able to do. And he goes off and, and, and picks up right where Elijah left off. Because on the way up to the mountain, Elijah takes his, his cloak and he hits the water of the Jordan River and it parts and they walk across it. So Elisha on the way back goes, well, I got his cloak now. I'm going to hit the water. Boom, part the water, walk across. He's like, this is cool. I like this. <laughs> right, so he is, he is this, this picture. If we were to, to, to take this and relate ourselves to it, he's the picture of Jesus. And so he asked two questions, the same two questions that Jesus will ask when you come to him. Number one, what can I do for you? What, what do you need? But then the second thing that he asks is what do you have in your house? What do you have? You know, that we find a pattern where this takes place all over the Bible. Go back to Exodus chapter four when God calls Moses. And, and Moses, he's given Moses vision of what he's gonna do and how am I gonna do it? He goes, what is that you got there in your hand? Like, God, it's just a rod. It's all I got. And he takes and he adds power to that rod, right? He tells him, throw it down. It's going to become a snake. Then then pick it up and it'll be a rod again. He used this rod for power. This is the rod that he had him strike the ground with the part the Red Sea and to strike a rock to bring water out of it. But God wanted to know, what do you have? What do you have that I could do something with? We even go to to Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 14, when they come to him uh, to, to feed the, it says the 5,000 men plus women and children, maybe 10, 15,000 people, and we need to feed these people. And so Jesus' question is, well, what do we got? What do you have? Well, we got some bread and some fish, five loaves, two fish. He goes, All right, give it to me. You know that when we take what we have, God wants what you have. When you give it to him, it can do more than it can in your hands. Right? You, you, you take the five loaves and two fish and give it to Jesus, and thousands of people get fed. You, know, you take a rod that's just a stick, but you give it to God, and now it becomes power. And so here this woman has the same opportunity. The prophet asks her, what do you have? She says, well, all I got is this little jar of oil. This is what I got. It's all I have. So let's find out where we, where we go next. Let's read verse 4. Well, actually three, I didn't read three yet. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels do not gather just a few. And when you've come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, and then pour into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. I love this. Like he just, isn't how God is to speak so matter-of-factly about something so crazy? Here's what you're going to do. You see that little jar you've got? What you're going to do is you're going to get a whole bunch of vessels. Don't get just a few. Get lots of them. And bring them in here. And then you're just going to take and you're going to fill all those up with that little jar that you have. Okay. I don't know how it's going to work, but okay, let's do it. We'll do it. And so what does she do? Then she goes out. So, So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. So took that little right here, all right, and you bring a 55-gallon drum over here, and we're just going to fill that up with this. But she did it, didn't she? But I was thinking about what what he has her do and why. If you think that if God's going to multiply all this oil, why does he need her to go collect a bunch of vessels? Can't he just make some vessels too? I mean, he's God. He's going to multiply oil. Why does he need her to go get vessels? Well, I think there's two reasons. Number one, it's an act of faith. Right? It is that I have to actually step out and do based on what I believe. The 
prophet just told me to do this. God just told me to do this. I'm going to do it. And she had to go knock on doors, the very people who hadn't been helping her, the very people who were supposed to be helping her, and knock on the door and say, um, you got any empty vessels in here? I need them. What do you need them for? Well, I'm going to fill them with oil. With what? Where are you going to get this oil? I don't know, but just give me the vessels. I'm going to go fill them. And there's, and there's some faith involved with this, not just to do that, but that what goes on in your mind? Right? Have, you, have you ever been in that place where you know you're standing for God to do something and believing for God to do something and you're praying for something, but you don't want to tell anybody in case it doesn't happen? You kind of want to actually say that God's going to do this because then what if he doesn't, then I'm going to look really dumb. But she goes around and collects all these. Now there's a second part of this re- related a bit there to the first. I believe that God established a rule that the people were supposed to take care of her, so he's going to find a way to make those people take care of her. If all they're going to do is give her some empty vessels, they're going to have to give her something. And so they do. So she collects all these vessels, comes to her house. We don't know how many there were, but I'm sure there was a lot based on what the end result here is. Now verse 6, now it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Right, so I picture the situation that they've gone out, collected vessels. Was everybody, was everybody gung-ho in this? Did they collect as many as they possibly could have collected? Or was there, well, we don't got to collect many, right? Just collect a few, how, many, how much oils are going to be? They start collecting, but did they really collect as many as they could have? Right, because... I picture her, she asked for that last one. Okay, give me one more. Uh, Yeah, we're out. I told you to go another block over and go ask them too. (laughs) Did you do that? Did you get all the vessels we could have? Because then the oil ceased. It stopped flowing once there were no more vessels to fill. Now, you might be here thinking you're putting two and two together. You're like, okay, it's hard for the house. They're fundraising. I know what he's about to do right now, and you're going to be wrong. So I want us to put another spin on this, right? Because I know we can look at this, and, 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 there's, and the word is multifaceted, but I fully believe that you sow that little bit that you've got instead of holding on to it in fear, and God multiplies and does supernatural things. I've seen it in my own life. But that's not the, the angle I want us to look at today. Let's look at the vessels and the oil. I believe the oil is the most important part of this story. See, the oil that they would be using would be called, would be olive oil. And olive, olives and olive oil is an interesting thing. Uh, olive oil is made by pressing in what they call, well, an a, a, a oil press, a large millstone. Uh, up to 6,000 pounds per square inch of pressure is put on olives to extract the olive oil. You can't get the oil the way you need it just out of squeezing the fruit of an olive, you have to actually crush it with the seed. If you only crush the fruit, all you get is this white bitter sap. You have to crush the seed too. The whole thing has to be crushed. That olives throughout the word of God and olive oil is a picture of Jesus Christ. That Jesus was the one pressed for us. That, that it is his pressing, in fact, uh, the, the place where the pressing truly began for him was the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was under such pressure, the weight of the sin of mankind coming upon him that it says he sweat great drops of blood. So much pressure. You know that the name Gethsemane, where he was, means oil press or an olive press. There were all the olive trees. It's where they would harvest the olives and he would press them to get this oil. Something interesting I found out about olive oil as well is that there are three pressings that they would do to extract the olive oil, three different pressings, and each one produced a different product. The first pressing, when you press olives, produced the oil that they would use in the temple to light the the lampstands. It's a picture for us, Jesus, when he was pressed, what comes from him is the light. He's the light of the world. So that light, the source of light came from him. The second thing that olive pressing, the second pressing they do, produces uh, medicinal olive oil that they use for medicinal purposes, that Jesus, by his crushing the stripes upon his back, were healed. And then the third thing, the third pressing that they do produces what they use to make soap. 
And so out of Jesus pressing, we were cleansed, we were washed of all unrighteousness. So Jesus is the oil. If we were to look at this picture, that Jesus is the oil. Every one of us, wrote, what did it say that she began with? She, all I have is this little jar of oil. That's all you need. You begin with all you need is a little bit of Jesus. That's all you need. All you need is a little bit. And there's so much you can get done because that source of oil is you. Okay, let's look at this. It's you. You're the vessel. That oil that's in you, it's not limited by what's right there. Just like that woman whose jar was, seemed like it had a, a finite amount of oil in it, it's connected to an infinite source. Like an oil well, a lot of times they'll be, they'll be drilling oil, and as they, as they have extracted oil, matter of fact, there's a famous one back in the, the late 70s that they uh, had begun down in the Gulf, that they thought by, by the late 80s that it was drained. They weren't getting oil out of it anymore. This is a big story back then that suddenly it seemed like they tapped into something deeper and all of a sudden the oil coming up was fresh and better than the old oil was and, and, and producing multiple times what it was before. So you have that in you. You have this source of oil. You have just that little bit of Jesus in you. You've got what you need. But let's take it a little step further. Let's go over to Psalm 92. We're going to start at verse 10. This is David speaking. He says, but my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. Does anybody have a Bible that says unicorn right there? King James says unicorn. That's funny. See, there's the unicorns aren't in the Bible. Yes, they are. It said right there that there's a unicorn in the Bible, and I want the oil of a unicorn. That sounds cool. But mine says a wild ox. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies, my ears, my desire on the wicked who rise against me. So what is he saying? This oil, and oil is important, and it's important that we get fresh oil. Now see, you received Jesus and you have this in you, but you know, it's important that we are continually receiving from him so that our oil remains fresh. You never lose it, but you know, things in this can become stale if we, it's not, there's not a continual refreshing. This is why we, we come to church, right? There's, that we spend six days out in the world doing our thing. And you spend one day, you come into his house and get charged back up again. Get some fresh oil in there. And I know you can get fresh oil studying your Bible every day. I'm, I'm not saying you can't do that, but the God has established something. And here's, here's how I know this. The very beginning of this psalm, if you read it, the Psalm 92, a praise to the Lord and his, uh, for his love and faithfulness, a, psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. Matter of fact, this is the only one of David's psalms that, it was, that was written for the Sabbath day, the day that they came together. There's something about when we come together in his house, and whatever our Sabbath day is, we live in a Sabbath. There's no one day that's the Sabbath now. We live in it. But there is a day a week that we decide that we're going to come together and we're going to receive. We're going to eat together. We're going to have our oil refreshed. And if we go a little bit further in verse 12, it says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age, praise God. That one just gets more and more relevant every day that passes. <laughs> they shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. See, this is all about his house. There's oil that flows from his house. One of the things that's said there that happened when he says that this, this refreshing or this fresh oil causes him, it said back in verse 10 or 11, his eye has seen the desire of his enemies and his ear the desire on the wicked. That when you get connected to this oil, your eyes see victory. Your ears hear victory. <laughs> doesn't matter what's coming, what your enemies got coming against you. You see what your enemies are doing five steps ahead. You're ready, right? That, that, that when we know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, whatever's gonna come against us, we're ready for it. Even though we know that, sometimes it's harder when it's a surprise. 
right, when it just comes out of nowhere. But you know that through, through being connected and, and continually being recharged with his oil, we have the ability to be prepared, be ready. It doesn't matter what's coming. We've seen it coming. We're ready for it. And a matter of fact, when we know we're in his rest, which I've been teaching a lot about lately, staying in his rest, we know that whatever comes against me, I don't have to worry about it. It doesn't matter what the battle is, I know I'm going to win. All right, so we know we have this uh, available to us, working in us, this oil of God. The anointing brings eyes that see victory and ears that hear victory. In Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27, I'll just, well, uh, let's go read it. We got time. Isaiah 10 and verse 27. This was talking about Jesus. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. That yokes get destroyed. You know that the God is not about breaking a yoke. He likes to destroy yokes. Right? There's a difference. Something that's been broken can be put back together. Something that's destroyed, it's done. And why? It's because of this anointing oil. I believe that you, you stay connected to that anointing oil and yokes become destroyed in your life. There are things that, there are things that, that, that the moment you were saved, there was, there was a yoke broken off of you. The yoke of, of sin and death broken off of you. But you know, we have other yokes on us that we don't know about and we, we discover as we go. And we need that continual uh, a, uh, renewing or, or consumption of that anointed oil of Jesus Christ into our lives to continue to break those things off of us. But I'm gonna take you to one last piece. Now she was to go out and to go bring in empty vessels, to bring those, those in that could be filled. You know that everything that God does and that he, he wants to do in your life is not just about you, but that, that he has others in mind. And so that it's important for us to know that there are empty vessels all around us that need filling. We have a neighborhood full of empty vessels that need filling. Every one of the seats in here that doesn't have somebody in it is a potential empty vessel that could be in it, that could be getting filled. Right, there's, there's empty vessels sitting in a cubicle next to you at work, right? Frank in accounting that you can't stand. He's probably an empty vessel. <laughs> right, there, there's empty vessels ringing you up at the grocery store. There's empty vessels dropping your mail off every day. There's empty vessels that are neighbors walking their dog down the street. There are empty vessels all around us. That, well, as we're talking about the heart for the house, What's God's heart for his house? Or he wants as many vessels to come in to be filled every single time these doors are open. That's what his house is for. His house is to be a place that people are being filled up. And so what I would say is that we, as we're thinking about what's, what's our heart for his house, my, ho my heart is what his is. That as many empty vessels as we can get in here. And you know, every one of us, I mean, yeah, we, we got our initial Emptiness filled when we receive Christ, but we all have empty parts of our lives. See, for her, it was a financial emptiness that she had. And did God not meet that in an abundant way? In fact, if we, we were to read verse seven back there in, in 2 Kings 4, it says that she was able to take all that she had and pay off all the debt and then live on the rest. There is provision for her that God wants whatever the emptiness that every one of us has to not just meet the need, but to abundantly meet the need. Jesus said in John 10, 10, that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, but I come that you'd have life and life abundant, right? He wants you to be full so that there's so much spilling out of you that you're filling up vessels before you can even get them here, right? It's just spilling over into other people's lives. But that's the heart for his house. I would challenge you to think about, and it probably won't take long, to think about some empty vessels and don't like go somewhere else with them. There's maybe some empty heads, and I get that, and they're hollow and all that, but we're talking about something different here. Empty vessels around you that could be brought into the house of God to receive the same oil that you receive every single week. Amen? 
Amen. If you got anything out of that, give the Lord a hand.